In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the Roman war god Mars, the bringer of war. Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome back. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the deity Mars. Now, right now I'm standing in front of the Temple of Mars, the Avenger, Mars Ulano, in Rome. So this is a reconstruction, a digital reconstruction, and I thought it would be a great one to start off about talking about Mars himself. Now, when we think about Mars, we think of the god of war, and he's a really interesting deity because so often we are presented maybe with a Hollywood image of this angry, destructive deity, when actually the Romans didn't view Mars like that. When we're looking at Mars, we have to understand that he starts off probably as an Italic or one of the tribes of Italy, um, a deity of nature. And probably as a nature deity, the Romans then started worshipping more and more, and he becomes more associated with war as well. Because not only is he a nature deity, but he's also an, a god of agriculture, which is quite interesting because many war gods aren't often depicted. They're depicted solely within the aspect of war or things like that. But instead, what we have here is with Mars, is a deity who is also an agrarian god. When he's an agrarian god, this actually fits in very much so with how the Romans view themselves, because the Romans view themselves as both martial and warriors and fighting and the militaristic campaigning and conquest, with also the fact that the ultimate ideal for a Roman is to be a citizen owning land and farming that land, maybe not necessarily yourself, more often than not with slaves, but then that was the ideal, the dream of being a landowner and a citizen. So Mars himself, being both a martial war deity and also a god of agriculture, fits very nicely together. And on occasion, he would be combined with Sylvanus, the god of the woodlands or the or wild places, to create a more agriculture, more nature-focused deity as well. And it's quite an interesting one to have a look at that because Mars, with his warlike characteristics, is also seen as a very virile god. And some of his priests in some of the temples in Rome would dance aggressively with swords to actually try and uh, make the land more fertile and get a bumper crop. So again, we see an aspect of fertility within Mars that people might be surprised about. Because so often we think of war gods as only about the martial and the death and the fighting side of things, but Mars is a lot more complex than just that. Now when we've got this, we also should look at his animals, because he's got a number of animals he's associated with. First of all is the woodpecker. Now it's a bit of an interesting one. I, when I was doing this research, was quite surprised to see that the woodpecker was seen as one of Mars's animals. And the reason why is because of its persistence. So the woodpecker, when it hole in the tree of the hardest of woods, so because of that, that was seen as something that Mars would do, that he was persistent and he would keep going and going and going until victory was secured. You've also got the wolf, which is obviously throughout the whole of uh, Europe and other parts of the world as well. The wolf is a terrifying animal and obviously they're pack animals, they work together and they're very dangerous to humans, which is why they're extinct in so many parts of the world and they've been forced out, especially, you know, I'm talking about my own scenario here in the British Isles, where there are no wolves other than the ones that are carefully controlled in Scotland. So again, it's another one where an animal that is seen as very dangerous, it's a very large animal and it works in groups, is associated with him as well. He's also associated with bears as well, which is a very strong animal, a very fierce animal, and one you don't want to get on the wrong side of when it's angry. Later on, we'll talk about one of the animals he's depicted with up here on Hadrian's Wall as well, but I'll leave that as a little bit of a surprise so you can see that when we come to the images. When we talk about the Roman gods, it's often simplified that they're just the Greek gods with a nice Italic Roman veneer on top of them. Often people take Mars and they say, actually, he's Ares, the Greek god of war. Now, the difference is, is the Greeks viewed Ares as a very destructive character. They viewed him as this character who caused strife, who caused danger, who caused derision, and he was always angry and dangerous. And so because of that, when you actually compare him to Mars, the Romans view Mars as a stabilizing force, which is really different to Ares. Ares is destabilizing. Mars, on the other hand, he is stabilizing. He brings about peace through military conquest and combined with his agrarian aspect as well, can also show prosperity too. So you've got a very interesting difference between the two of them there. 
In the Greek version as well, Ma Ares is the son of Zeus and Hera, whereas in the Roman version, he's actually quite different where he comes from. His conception is a different story. I mentioned previously in the uh, Capitoline Triad video about the fact Minerva was born out of Jupiter's head uh, with the fact that Jupiter eats her mother and when he eats her mother she is born inside of his head and then from there um, they bring Vulcan in with his hammer, crack open his skull and then out comes Minerva fully armed and armoured as a fully grown uh, god from Jupiter's skull. Now because she hasn't been born from a woman as such, there has to be balance within the deities. There has to be that balance between both Minerva and on the other side we now have Mars. So what happens is that Hera, seeing that Minerva's been born from Jupiter's head, goes and speaks to Flora. And Flora is the goddess of flowers and is the goddess of nature. And so Flora picks a magic flower, and when she has this magic flower, she says that this magic flower can cause people to become pregnant instantly. So they test it on a cow, and the heifer immediately becomes pregnant. So because of that, they then take it and they press it onto Juno's um, belly, onto her stomach. And so when they press it onto that, she instantly becomes pregnant, and she goes to see out her pregnancy in Frace. She goes to Frace, and then on, on the shores of Marama, she then gives birth to Mars. Now again, this is really interesting because the Romans viewed the Thracians as a very warlike people. They viewed them as sort of like one of the fiercest barbarians that were possible. And so when you've got that connection there, Mars is born amongst a fierce barbarian culture that the Romans grudgingly respect. They're like some of the greatest barbarians alongside the Persians and other people like that. And so he is born in that area. And again, you can see where the Romans have taken their cultural understanding of the world around them and go, well, our God of war was born there. So maybe you know, they would infer that Mars would be warlike because of the Thracians or the Thracians were warlike because Mars was born there. Again, you have to maybe, so much has been lost over history, but I'm sure there is a connection there that I would love to look into more de depth. And so that then creates a balance. Mars is born without a father. He is born from two female goddesses. Flora is involved with her power over nature and plants and how they grow and how there is fertility there with Juno. And when she's involved with Juno, they then give birth to the war god, who is also an agricultural god. So you don't see Jupiter's involvement in this. Just in the same way that Juno is not involved in the birthing of Minerva. So you have balance in the system. Mars and Minerva balance each other out. There is now balance between both Mars and Minerva. And so because of that, we have very interesting understandings of how the Romans view their gods. And it's a really interesting one when we look at Mars in himself as this war deity having been born from a fertility and nature de goddess, or sort of Flora, the goddess of plants and things like that, and a mother deity as well, and Jupiter's not involved at all. So quite an interesting one there when we consider how, you know, we've got this powerful, dangerous war god and how the Romans are actually structuring him as well. So really quite an interesting one there. Mars's festivals were at the start and the end of the campaigning season. And the really interesting thing is that the, st and the start of the year for the Romans was on the 1st of March, which was seen as the day when Mars was born. So you've got the start of the campaigning season, the start of the year, and then the campaigning season finishes on in October, uh, which was obviously not the end of the year because the year would then continue obviously again till the 1st of March. So you've got this interesting thing where in the period where you're able to fight, it starts off with the birth of Mars and then his final festival stops at the end of that. So again, the year is structured around when you can fight. Again, a really interesting one when we consider the Romans and it's a really uh, how they sort of view themselves as a, a warlike people and as a, um, a, a conquering people and how their year starts around the time when you can actually start fighting again. And so Mars is incredibly important alongside the fact that Mars is actually seen as the father of their people because he is the father of Romulus and Remus. So when he's the father of Romulus and Remus, he is the father of the Romans as a whole. 
combined with this that his uh, lover is Venus and Venus was seen as the mother of Aeneas who was a Trojan who fled Troy and apparently set up a city before Rome in and around the foothills of what would eventually become Rome. So you're combining together the two mythologies about Rome. You've got Aeneas from Venus and then the goddess of love. And then you've got Mars with Romulus and Remus, his sons. And then those two conflate together to make the Romans. So with the two myths of where they came from, Mars and Venus being lovers, then unites that together as well. You'd also think, well, maybe it's a bit odd that the goddess of love and the god of war are the ones who are lovers together. But Venus has victory and success and things like that and luck and fortune all tied up in her attributes. Whereas Mars, obviously, as we've gone over again, is also seen as virile through his agriculture. So both of them coming together and having lo uh, a loving relationship, you can see that there is an, a way that you can actually combine them together to create these two deities that make sense as lovers. In Roman tombs, when husband and wife had died, you would actually see them depicted as Mars and Venus, because it was seen as an incredibly loving pairing together. And it's also very, very complementary to the dead. And when it's very, very complementary to the dead, you can understand most men within Roman society probably would want to be like Mars, and most women would want to be similar to Venus because of the attractiveness of both deities. And that's a very interesting one right there. Mars and Venus also had a daughter. Um, when they had a daughter, that is Concordia. And Concordia is a really interesting one because she was paired with Pax or Peace. And so Concordia's area was agreement, not only um, agreement as in between two people, but agreement in marriage and also agreement within the state and a stable society. Those were her attributes. So the god of war on one hand and the goddess of love come together to make peace, stable society and agreement between people. And so that's a very interesting one looking together. And the later on emperors would venerate Concordia Augusta or the spirit of peace within the empire or from the emperor as well. And she was a very important deity for them. But what we'll do now is I'm going to show you images of how Mars is depicted up here on the northern frontier in Britain, not only in his classical aspect, but also in a more native aspect as well. So right here we have different depictions of Mars from both the Antonine frontier, which was the, the frontier in southern Scotland, which was used after Emperor Hadrian's death by Antonius Pius, the next emperor, and then after the death of Antonius Pius was then abandoned and Hadrian's Wall was remanned and was the frontier of the northern part of Britain and the Roman Empire right the way through to the end of Roman Empire in Britain somewhere in the 5th century or the early part of the 5th century uh, AD. So right here to start off with, this is a depiction of Mars from the Antonine Wall. When we've got this depiction of Mars, it's a very classical depiction, which all of these behind me are classical depictions or Mediterranean depictions of Mars, which we'll come to and talk more about when we contrast them with the more native styles or cruder styles of Mars that I'll show you in a minute as well. So what we have here is Mars is wearing a cloak. He's got his gladius wearing high at his side. Then down here, we've got his shield. He's got greaves on his legs. Uh, you can see his boots just down there. He's probably wearing a cuirass, which is a breastplate. Um, and he's wearing a belt across it, which could be interpreted as the belt of Hercules, uh, just there across his uh, waist. He's got a very traditional helmet, which is very stylized. You can also see that in the, most, the later depiction of Mars, just here on my other side, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then he's also carrying just out of sight here, a little spear, and that is the depiction of Mars there. It's a very nice, clean depiction of Mars as this god of war. It's got a lot of nice Republican Roman uh, images within it because he's got his nice round shield, which is Hellenistic in style and is similar to the sort of shields that you'd imagine them be using during the sort of the uh, the earlier Republican period influenced by the Greek hoplite shields. He's wearing a very traditional older style of helmet which becomes more romanced and much more traditional in style as well. And then he's got the officer's uh, pertiges which hang down from his waist as well which is a sign of rank and a very uh, stylistic um, 
they originally started off in the, the sort of the Greek period to tangle a tax towards the legs, but instead became much more symbolic of a sort of like um, Hellenistic heroes like Achilles and people like that. So we're seeing a very much a, a stylized version of Mars right here. Then the next one along is the one right here. This is from a comb of Indolanda. This comb of Indolanda has got Mars in the center, which has been added into this lovely wooden comb. You can just see his spear right here, his helmet and his armor, and that's Mars right there. Moving on, this one here is a depiction of Mars from Chester's Roman fort on Hadrian's Wall. Now this depiction of Mars is quite cool as well, because again, we've got a shield right here, just down the bottom. You can see Mars is holding his spear. We've got again the very stylized form of helmet, which is very similar to what we can see with Republican, almost Hellenistic styles of Roman soldier as well. Um, I'm just putting up an image on the screen right now so you can see what I'm talking about when I refer to that. Then you can see on his chest, he's wearing again this muscled cuirass. Then at the bottom, you can see that he's also wearing greaves as well on his legs. So again, we've got this stylized classical depiction of Mars, muscle cuirass, stylistic, Hellenistic style of the Republican soldier. The only interesting thing that I find is the shield, which looks very similar to what you see in the third century AD with the Durus Europa shield, and especially with a holding handle as well on that. But again, we could be seeing where the artist is depicting the style of shields that they're using on Hadrian's Wall at that time. Or again, it could be a depiction of that more classical style of shield that you see from the Hellenistic um, soldiers as well as I mentioned earlier on with the Antonine Wall Mars right here. Right here, the final depiction of Mars we have is from the 4th century. Now this 4th century Mars is from York, and it would have been in the Legion Fortress in York where it was discovered later on. Again, we've got some very similar styles to the earlier Antonine, but it's done in a far more romantic sense as well though it has opened up discussion as to whether or not this is a depiction of what officers would be, would be wearing in the 4th century as well, but we'll come to that in a second. So again, when you look at it, you can see he's got his muscled cuirass on again, just like the Antonine depiction and also the depiction from Chester's. Then on his head, you can see again the very much romantic Hellenistic style of helmet. Um, he's in this hand, probably would have been holding a spear which Mars is generally depicted holding a spear. On his side here, you can just see a sword hanging from his side. He's got his shield again and the greaves on his leg and the pertiges. So just like the one here from the Antonine Wall, he is also wearing what a Roman officer would have had in the fourth century. So the pertiges, the cuirass, um, not so the Hel Hellenistic helmet, but he's also got his big round shield and he'd have a spear as well. So we've got a combination of things here from the probably first century AD from Vindolanda right the way through to the fourth century right here, a very, very clear, concise depiction of Mars throughout all of these different periods. When we have this concise depiction of Mars, it's quite a brilliant one to, to actually be able to look at because we've got the same features throughout. There are some slight differences, obviously. So, for instance, in these, this one here, you can see Mars is wearing a cloak, but he has also got his pertiges, which is a type of officer's dress within the Roman army. So when you see the Roman soldier and he's wearing um, this skirt at the bottom made of individual pieces of fabric hanging down in colors, that there is the pertiges. It originally started off with um, probably a form of defense, to actually stop uh, spears and swords going at your legs, but then became far more in, of an example of how officers should dress and was used by both centurions and, and all officers ranking right the way up to the top of the Roman military and was associated again a lot more with heroes too um, and gods. So they would copy, the, of, the officers would copy stylistic representations in some ways of these heroes and gods in what they wore too. So when we look at the fourth century one again, you can see the Pertiges coming down, but he's still wearing his uh, muscled cuirass in both depictions and also as well here, you can see the muscled cuirass very clearly on the one from Chester's as well. 
clear depictions of what Mars would be like armed with spear, sword, shield, muscled cuirass, stylistic helmet and the greaves on his leg all coming together to give an image of the war god within the classical Mediterranean style. So there's some images there of him from the northern frontier of Britain. Now let's look at some other depictions as well and have a discussion about them too. So we've looked at some of the classical depictions of Mars, but now we're going to look at some of the more rough and ready ones right from up here on the northern frontier in Britain. So starting off right here, we have this depiction of Mars from Vindolanda again. So it's a bronze image of Mars, and I'm not entirely sure how they've decided this is Mars, but when you look at the Vindolanda fine sheet, they say this is Mars, the god of war. There's probably a very good reason why they've said it's Mars, but to me it would seem like any divine figure which is quite uh, badly eroded but right here this is one of the more rough and ready ones and I hope that when it was actually originally cast it looks slightly more different to how it is now. It's probably depicted as Mars because of his more stylistic Hellenistic helmet on the top there. Following on here we've got a wonderful third century native British style of Mars right here. Now the reason why it's more native is because the fact that native Britons when they did it, uh, their statues they would put more almond shaped eyes onto them so less realistic than the Roman Mediterranean style classical style of architecture but right here we have Mars depicted with more almond eyes he's got a beard as well and then across his chest you can actually see the baldric of his sword and this is very much in the third century style of a thicker, larger baldric where they would hang their swords across their body because the sword of the Roman soldier changed over the period. It went from being the gladius, which was worn on your right hand side and you would draw it from your right so as to help with the close quarter fighting that the Roman soldiers had to do, to being a cross body draw, which was done with the longer Sparfa sword, which was adopted from the Celtic and Germanic peoples. So right here, he's wearing his baldric across his chest and obviously his arms, his shield and his other armour are not represented. They've been broken over time. But that's one from South Shields here at Roman Fort, um, which is called Arbea. Then over on the other side, we've got another depiction which can be seen at Chester's as well, which originally came from Housteads. And this is apparently Mars too. So it's a, a relief of Mars that would have been in a building around Housteads Fort. Now again, I love this depiction because it's so crude. When you compare it to the other versions of Mars, you're just like, well, what's going on? The other depictions of Mars are very classical. You can clearly tell, you know, his muscled cuirass, all of those sort of things that show him as the war god. Here, this leaves something to the imagination. You can still see his shield, his spear. You can just see the outline of a cuirass on his chest. You've got a very much a stylistic head and helmet right there and then the greaves on his legs down here. But this has been um, interpreted as Mars, the war god. It's where a soldier has wanted to set up an icon of Mars that they may be honouring him or saying thank you to him for success in battle or something like that. And so they've quickly carved it out with whatever skill they have and then set it up in a location at the fort where someone can see it. And so this is a very different depiction of Mars than the more expensive, more carefully, more Mediterranean classical styles of depictions that you saw in the previous panel. We're going to move on now to have a look at another image from the Antonine War showing some worship towards Mars there too. So right here what we have is a dedication from the Antonine Wall in what is now modern day Scotland. Now when you have this dedication stone, this is actually a dedication where we're seeing a lot of different things going on. Now when this is dedicated it shows first of all on this side victory in war. We've got a Roman cavalry officer riding down the native Britons. You can see the native Britons defeated on the ground there. There is the rectangular shield of the natives in his hand. You can see the, uh, the cavalry officer right here is armed with a spear and he's riding down the natives who are depicted as naked whereas he is heavily armed, heavily armoured and showing the superiority of the Roman war machine on this side right here. 
On the other side, we have a non-militaristic depiction, but it's still got its own military efforts in it as well. And on this side here, we have a group of soldiers from the Second Legion Augusta. And these group of soldiers from the Second Legion Augusta, which you can just see on their vexillium or their flag right here, are making a sacrifice to Mars. They've set up the sacrifices, which is a goat, a sheep, and a pig. And they are then going to sacrifice these to Mars as a thank you, not only of the completion of the frontier, but also probably a, uh, a thank you as well in regards to the military efforts that they've been through. And they are thanking Mars for success in the campaign, but then probably looking on to the continuation of their careers, because obviously they're thanking him that their brothers in arms haven't died. They're then maybe looking more towards Mars in his agricultural and stability uh, roles as well. And they're looking forward to a peaceful uh, rest of their service on the war, away from the conflict and warfare that they've previously experienced. And so they've set this up, said thank you to Mars for all of the success they've had in the conflict. And now they've now completed the war. This is a dedication to him and thanking him for his role within that. This is my final depiction of Mars for this episode. And this is from Chester's On Hadrian's War, but originally would have been from Halstead's Roman Fort. Now again, very similar to the other depiction, what we have here is Mars, probably from the third century, because you can see that thick but, um, baldric across his chest. You can see his sword at his side. There is his spear, his curved shield, very similar to the Duros Europa shield, which I'll just show on the screen right now. Large curved round shield, which was very popular in the third, fourth and fifth centuries of the Roman soldier. You can see again, this is a more classical depiction. He's wearing his pertiges. He's got his greaves on his legs, the more classical helmet at the top, and he's got his spear in his hand again. So we've got Mars right here. But the reason why I wanted to show it is because of the fact it shows another animal that is represented with Mars, and that's this animal right here. Now looking at it, you may not be able to identify it straight away, but it's actually a goose. And I find this really interesting because we've talked already before how Mars is associated with woodpeckers, with wolves and bears. Now, many of you might think wolves and bears, they make sense. You've got the, the risk, the danger, the violence of what's associated with those animals. A woodpecker, once it's explained with its persistence and its ability to take through the hardest of wood, also makes sense. But a goose, you might go, well, what does a goose have to do with Mars, the god of war? But this animal right here is actually a goose. And the goose is a very interesting one because there's two possibilities. One of them is the fact that when Rome was attacked by um, Gauls or Celts, um, there was a very interesting instance where the, the dogs did not wake up and instead the geese actually went and honked and made lots of noise, waking up the Roman soldiers and enabling them to push back the attack. And so they were venerated as a protector of Rome. But alongside this as well, they were also seen as quite a violent animal. Now, if you've uh, ever seen a goose chasing someone, they can be incredibly determined and actually quite a painful experience to be bitten by a goose. And I'm sure if you just type into YouTube now of like goose attacks and stuff like that, you can see the effect of what these animals can do and so many, sometimes comedic, sometimes quite unpleasant as well. And so I love that right here, Mars, the god of war, is also associated with a goose because of the violence that they have, also probably from their protective aspect to Rome itself. And so I would love to show this off because we've got a sort of halfway house depiction of Mars here. He's shown with all of the classical Mediterranean trappings, but the carving itself looks far more sort of like um, the soldiers themselves have done it. And it hasn't been done maybe to the same level of classical expertise that you might see in some of the more expensive or more um, done out uh, depictions of Mars, like for instance, the one from the Legion Fortress in York. So I really hope you've enjoyed this episode where we've looked at Mars, uh, the war god of the Romans, and I've been able to take you through the whole story of this deity from his conception as an italic woodland or nature god right the way through to how his um, he differs from the Greek god Ares, his conception, his romance with the goddess Venus and how that aspect to his character, but also how he was depicted 
up here on the northern frontier of Britain in both classical and slightly more native or rougher styles as the soldiers wanted to honor their God as best they could and get the uh, benefit or the, the actual um, religious significance of that, both with the legions themselves thanking him for successful campaigns and completion of, let's say, the Antonine Wall, and then normal soldiers at Halstead's Roman fort in the center of Hadrian's Wall, just carving a rough image of the god into a stone so that they could then get the benefit of his, ple his pleasure, his stability, his strength, and their protection as well in any conflicts that they were having to face. So I hope this whole episode bringing together all of these different aspects of Mars and his importance to the Roman people has been an enjoyable one to you. As always, please do like and subscribe, share the video with your friends. If you would like to, I do have a Patreon as well, so you can support me there. But please join me again for the next episode where we'll continue looking at the Roman gods and the various different aspects of them. Until next time, though, stay safe and well, and thank you so much for joining me.